everyone. Good afternoon. Happy International Women's Day and a happy Women's History Month. My name is Saba and I'm the Special Projects Assistant and the host of this Library Lunch Hour, Women of the Archives. We're excited for you all to join us and we hope you're ready to celebrate the lives and legacies of Puerto Rican women represented throughout our Centro Archives. Additionally, we'd like to know what you want to see in our upcoming Library Lunch, lunch Hours. So we will be dropping a link in our chat to a quick form. And I'll now hand it off to our library manager, Anibal, and our project archivist, Susan Klein, so we can get started. Thank you all so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you to share lunch with you once, once again uh, on a very important day and a very important month in Women's History Month. I'm joined by my colleague and central project archivist, Susan Klein, uh, who lent her expertise and insight into uh, sharing with all of you today uh, just uh, a little bit of information about the different collection papers that we have. Um, uh, really incredible, powerful, and meaningful women in our collection. Um, this is uh, not going to be a hundred percent in depth view on on each individual. public knows which uh, collections are available. And uh, this isn't even a full, um, uh, the, the full breadth of all the that we have uh, at the archive. So uh, I'm gonna start the presentation now. Um, and then Susan's gonna take over in a little bit as well. So the women of the Centro Archives. Uh, we start with Petra Allende. Uh, in the Petra Allende papers, um, we learn that Petra Allende was an important community activist and an East Harlem resident for over 30, often referred to as La, Alca La Alcaldesa del Barrio. She was a well-known advocate for senior citizen rights, community activist and senior citizens advocate. Her papers represent a resource uh, for research in grassroots organizing, community activism, senior citizen life in New York City, uh, particular in East Harlem, and the development of East Harlem. The materials document organizations that Allende was actively involved with, such as Community Board 11, Iris House, the Bonifacio Cora Tejedor Development Fund Corporation, the Institute for Puerto Rican Hispanic Elderly Inc. East Harlem Community Health Committee, and the Grand Orden Fraternal de Odfellos Latinos. The materials document cultural and political organizations and contain correspondence, clippings, community newspapers, memorabilia, photographs, and presentations. Uh, the next woman that, we that we're gonna be highlighting is uh, Juanita Arocho, who uh, is probably a uh, distant relative of mine, as she's a West Coast Tarocho as well. Uh, a pioneering presence in the Puerto Rican community of East Harlem, Juanita Arocho was a dedicated organizer and independentista who worked for the rights and freedoms of Puerto Ricans both on the island and in her home of New York. An active political figure, she was an, in addition an integral member of the Orden de la Estrella del Oriente, a local Puerto Rican Masonic order which figured prominently in both her personal and political activities. And as a community activist and journalist, her collection contains correspondence, articles, photographs, printed matter pertaining to her participation in the Masons and the movement for the independence of Puerto Rico. The papers provide insight into community organizing efforts in the Puerto Rican community of East Harlem, the Puerto Rican independence movements, and uh, the participation of the Puerto Rican community in Masonic orders. Enoveva de Alpeaga was a pianist, organist, teacher, choir director, and one of the principal interpreters of Johann Sebastian Bach. She was born in Ponce, Puerto Rico on October 22nd, 1898. The youngest of five children and the only daughter of prominent musicians Julio Carlos de Alpeaga and Nicolasa Toroellas. 
She completed primary and secondary schooling in Puerto Rico, where she began her musical training. First at the school of Pedro Moxo Banier, and then in her parents' Alpeaga Academy, where she studied piano, musical theory, organ, and voice. Her papers support research in the musical and cultural history of Puerto Rico, and the documents uh, uh, and the collection documents the growth of musical, literary, cultural, and civic organizations among Puerto Ricans in New York City. The papers include personal documents, correspondence, flyers, writings, invitations, newspaper clippings, scrapbooks, and photographs. The papers, which are primarily in Spanish, contain information about her, herself, her husband, Andres S. Dalmao, as well as her father, Julio de Alpeaga. Diana Caballero, seen in this photo with a uh, longtime Centro staff member and member of the New York State Board of Regents, Luis Reyes, um, Diana Caballero is an educator, community organizer, and activist. She has dedicated much of her life to developing civil rights and educational reform organizations. She was a member of the Young Lords Party, president of the National Congress for Puerto Rican Rights, director of the Puerto Rican Latino Education Roundtable. Caballero was born and raised in the South Bronx and went to public schools. After receiving an associate degree from the Borough of Manhattan Community College in Secretarial Studies, she went on to complete a BA in Elementary Education at City College of, uh, at City College of the City University of New York. In 1978, she graduated summa cum laude with a master's degree in elementary and bilingual education from LIU and obtained both an MA and an EdD in Educational Administration and Bilingual Education from Teachers College, Columbia University. From Hofstra University, she received a certificate of advanced study in educational administration. Diana Caballero's papers are important for the information and insight they offer right to equal educational opportunities in Puerto Rico and Latino communities of New York City. Advocacy for bilingual education, community efforts to get Latino representation on the Board of Education of the City of New York, and, the, and district board reform. The collection also provides a history of the Puerto Rican Latino education round perspective on the role Diana played in civil rights organizations, such as the National Congress for Puerto Rican Rights. Materials include administ administrative files, minutes, news clippings, reports, and press releases. Alice Caldona. Alice Caldona was born March 17th, 1930, the first of nine children born to Puerto Rican parents who migrated to New York City in 1923. She was raised and educated in Spanish Harlem. Upon graduating from high school in 1950, Cardona began to work in a store. During this period, she volunteered at the Legion de Maria, visiting and giving psychological support to Black and Latino people in need. The experience helped expand Cardona's understanding of the oppressive social, economic, and educational obstacles that these groups faced in New York. In 1961, Caldona decided to join the Sisters of St. John, a religious order based in Taylor, Texas. After a short time in the community, however, she decided that the religious life limited her abilities to affect change, so she abandoned the religious vocation. After this experience, Cardona returned to New York, where she worked for a financial institution and as a program co coordinator for United Bronx Parents. With United Bronx Parents, she oversaw programs that facilitated parental involvement in the school system and supervised youth in the summer job program. In 1964, she became involved in the first Head Start program in New York. Alice Cardona was a longtime activist and best commitment to women's rights and political representation. She worked and volunteered for ASPIRA, the National Conference of Puerto Rican Women, the Puerto Rican Latino Education Roundtable, the Puerto Rican Association for Community Affairs, and the National Latinas Caucus. From 1983 to 1995, as an assistant director of the New York State Division for Women, she supported numerous initiatives and community-based groups. The papers document the bilingual education movement in New York City, as well as the development of organizations that serve the needs of women and those oriented towards community development. 
The papers include biographical information, correspondence, news clippings, photographs, speeches, articles, and documents from various organizations, including regulations, programs, and meeting minutes. And now I'll, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, Susan's going to take over with uh, some more great women from our collection. Hey everyone, um, multiple women in the collection and we really had a hard time narrowing it down, but there's a few more that we really think are extraordinary. Uh, Ruth Reynolds was born in 1916 in South Dakota and she devoted many years of her life to the cause of Puerto Rican independence from the United States. She was greatly influenced by the Gandhian philosophy of nonviolence and was active in pacifist organizations and in the Presbyterian church. After an introduction to Pedro Albizu Campos, the National Party leader, she got involved in the movement for independence. She co-founded and became the executive secretary of the American League for Puerto, Rican, Puerto Rico's independence in 1944. And through that, she was able to go to Puerto Rico for the first time in 1945. However, she ended up in jail for her activism. She was charged with sedition and found guilty and sentenced to six years of hard labor in the insular penitentiary. However, she was released after a few years. Her experiences as a prisoner are well documented in her papers. Sofia Perez was born in 1909. Um, she is on the left and also in the middle, I'm sorry, in the photo on the right, holding a dashiki made by some of her students in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. She was born in Puerto Rico and came to New York in 1946 as a widowed mother of four children. She had experienced sewing and became a business owner of a bridal shop and a sewing school in Bed-Stuy. The school offered young people in the neighborhood the opportunity to obtain an employable skill, both boys and girls. She understood though that the struggle for Puerto Rican equality was part of a broader movement. She organized buses for Puerto Ricans to attend Martin Luther King's March on Washington. Kathy Andrade was a lifelong activist and leader in the labor movement. She left El Salvador for Miami, worked in the garment industry, and then eventually came to New York. She was very active in the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, the ILGWU. For them, she was the director of the Department of Education and was responsible for worker education programs. They did programs from the English language, um, all kinds of different things to enrich workers' uh, personal and professional lives. Within our papers, there is a lot of information about the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. This is one of the, was the largest labor union in the United States at one point, one of the largest. It was primarily women. It did not only have women in it. The focus was on men and women who were employed in the women's clothing industry. What I really appreciate about this collection is that it intersects with the broader labor movement. In these photos, you can see solidarity, solidarity with women from other backgrounds united together in joint causes, such as protest and support in support of farm workers. And you also will see that many of the members of the union were Chinese and they also participated with Chinese posters. The organization really, I think, did a great job um, publishing flyers in Spanish and Chinese and English in several different languages. And I, I think it's a really good opportunity to look at how Puerto Rican activists have interacted with other groups in New York City, because in the garment industry, a lot of the concerns were similar and they really did uh, support each other. And finally, we actually have a lot of unidentified women in our collections. They're, we could call them anonymous, but they're not, they weren't trying to be anonymous. We just don't know who they are. The photos and their stories are unknown. This is a photo of a delegate for the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. She appears to be wearing a dress that is made from fabric that shows the union label on it and also a very interesting hat. And this is a photo unlabeled. Someone must know who she is. These were families, workers, parents, sisters, friends. They are unknown and they are found in our collections created both by men and women. For example, the image on the left is from photographer Justo Marti. 
He was known for his photos of local businesses and bodegas, and he captured this image of women at a beauty salon. On the right-hand side is an image from garment workers from the Sofia Perez papers. On the surface, these photos of these unknown women can provide glimpses into the social life of women, fashion styles of the era, but there was definitely a lot more. We don't know the stories, but maybe you know who they are. And with that, I think um, Anibal is going to play a clip. Yeah, most certainly. Um, uh, but, and, but before I do, um, <clears throat> I just wanted to, to say that uh, Susan and I really did rack our brains quite a bit trying to, trying to figure out um, just who to include because there, there were so many um, pro um, prominent and not so prominent, right? Because it's, it's also women from, from all walks of life. Um, in the presentation, we saw women who were um, advocates for bilingual education, for labor. We saw women who were involved in the arts, um, leaders in their communities, leaders in business. Um, and, uh, you know, there are, there are other collections and there are, there are, you know, super prominent people such as Puro uh, Pre, which, you know, uh, we've done whole presentations on her in, in the past as well. Um, but just uh, to, to continue the thread, uh, that was not a pun about the International Garment Workers, Ladies Garment Workers Union. Um, uh, I did want to show a what I felt was like a, a pretty uh, interesting resource that Center produced a number of years ago um, that lives in our digital collections and that I think a lot more people need to know about. It was an award-winning radio program from 1985. Um, Nosotras trabajamos en la costura. Uh, we work in the garment industry, and it was a radio program that was based off of the work that was done uh, by the Oral Histories Task Force. Um, it's bilingual. There's you can um, you you can listen to it on our uh, digital collections page in English or in the Spanish version. And I wanted to play. Um, it's it's about half an hour long, but we're just going to play a handful of minutes of it. Um, and and please uh, feel free. I'm going to put a link. Um, to the resource in the chat um, so that you can, if you'd like to share it with your students or um, anyone who would be interested in this fascinating history of um, these uh, Puerto Rican women, their labor, their lives as laborers and, and their labor advocacy. Um, I think it's really, really great. And I'm gonna share that with you now. Hello? Quién llama? This is a portrait of Puerto Rican women in the garment industry. Nosotras trabajamos en la costura, produced by the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College in New York City. My mother's an embroiderer. She does such beautiful, intricate work. She's been doing that for 20 years now, ever since she came to this country. She raised me and my three sisters all by herself. And she doesn't speak English to this day. 
my grandmother learned to sew in Puerto Rico when she was a little girl, you know, uh, sewing and embroidering fancy lingerie for an American company. Then she came to New York in the 20s and, and she was a pionera, you know, and she spent all her life, you know, in a garment factory. We came to New York in 1948. My father drove a cab and my mother worked in a garment factory for 30 years. Just last Christmas, she was laid off permanently. And now she has to find a job at the minimum wage. That's a hard life, and it's happening to a lot of our parents. This program is about our mothers and grandmothers, the thousands of Puerto Rican women who spent their working lives as seamstresses in the garment factories of New York City. These are some of their stories that we at the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College in New York have been collecting. This is an effort to document and explain our history to ourselves, to our own communities, and to those who may want to share our lives. When Puerto Rico became a colony of the United States in 1898, American clothing manufacturers didn't waste much time. By 1915, they had set up a home needlework industry on the island. There they could escape from the unions and make bigger profits by using the labor of women and children. Lucila Padron is now in her 70s. She clearly remembers what her childhood was like. Era terrible. Era terrible. It was awful. I was born in Ponce, Puerto Rico. That's where I was raised and went to school. I started doing needlework when I was a little girl in order to help my parents because we were poor. After the housework and school, instead of playing, we had to sew. They taught us embroidery, hand stitching, and things like that. It was a sacrifice. Pero era un sacrificio. Lucila and her sister started working at home. Local contractors would distribute bundles of fabric already cut and ready to sew to women all across the island. The women would return the finished products beautifully sewn and embroidered all by hand. Then the work was shipped to New York and sold in exclusive department stores like Wanamaker's or Altman's. Yo me siento y este trabajo ya que un trabajo hecho a mano, no da nada de máquina a mano. Our work was really something to see. It was all done by hand. No machines. Tracing, embroidering, assembling, all of it by hand. And do you know what they paid us for all that intricate work? Later on, when I came to New York, I saw the clothes we made selling in Wanamaker on 14th Street. Here, those robes and dresses sold for a hundred dollars or more. There, they used to pay us for one of those robes with all that embroidery, three dollars. So, to earn ten or twelve dollars a week, we had to work day and night. Lucila was a teenager when she came to New York in 1927. She wanted to continue her education, but instead she had to support herself and then her own family. Cuando vine a Nueva York, primero pasé mucho trabajo porque no encontraba trabajo aquí en Nueva York en la costura. When I came to New York, I had a hard time at first because I couldn't find a sewing job. I used to walk back and forth across Manhattan from shop to shop from one end of the island to the other, until I finally found a job as a seamstress, again, earning very little money. I had to work. I couldn't just stay home. When you have children to raise, to support, and demand salary so little, the woman has to find a way to help out. I worked in garment factories for 30 years working so I could get where I am now and get okay, so um so that's just one one you know it was like a six minute clip of that uh 32 minute radio program um it's uh it's a phenomenal 
phenomenal program and I'm going to be putting um, the link to the Spanish version as well in the chat. Um, so please feel free to use that. You can use it with uh, any sort of uh, schoolwork or share it with your friends and family. Um, uh, this this uh, radio program came from uh, a series of oral histories that were done with women. And uh, as you can see, you know, it was, it was uh, a lot of poverty that um, these women lived through. And this was a, a way that they can make a, um, extra money. Um, and Puerto Rican needlework was considered some of the finest in the world. The lace work and the intricate, intricate details that were produced by these Puerto Rican labor, uh, laborers um, was, was world-class. Um, and expensive department stores uh, saw that and they paid $3 a piece for these intricate works that they then turned around and sold for $100 for a dress or a robe or undergarments. Um, so it's, it's really fascinating. And again, that's just one, uh, one resource of the you know, 25,000 digital records that we have in the digital collection. Um, and you can also listen to the to the oral histories um, that that help to make up um, this um, radio program. Uh, it's among you know hundreds of oral history recordings that we have in in, in our collections. And again, this won a, an award from the National Federation of Community Broadcasters in 1985. There really wasn't anything like this on the radio at the time, um, especially bilingual. Um, Susan, did, was there anything you wanted to add about about that? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. Um, so, someone, a couple of people asked some questions. Um, we asked them if you have any questions. Uh, we're we're opening up the Q and A now. We're going to have a Q and A for about, um, I'd say, you know, eight minutes. Um, uh, someone had asked uh, about the links to the to the um, to these uh, recordings. We we had placed them in the chat. Um, and uh, you can also, if, if uh, any of the people, um, of the individuals represented in our presentation today, if you want to learn more about them, you can feel free to reach out to us at our, um, if you don't want to reach out via the Q&A today, you can reach out via uh, our email address, and I'll also put that in the chat. It's uh, centro.library at hunter.cuny. Edu, and then you can also. I see Saba's all over, all over that already. She's already putting all our information in the chat. Thank you, Saba. Um, also, there's a form that you can fill out if you'd like to come and do research um, with uh, our collections, either on site or if you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one Zoom orientation. We've been doing that as well. That's been immensely popular. Um, do we have any of uh, okay, so we, have, we do have some, some uh, questions coming in. Do we have any garments or pictures of the embroidery? Um, I think we might have some pictures of, of what, the, what the embroidery had looked like. Um, but we would, have to, we, the, we would have to look through the collections. We don't have, we don't have any, we didn't have any for our presentation here. Um, um, but again, that's something that uh, it's either in our digital collection or we would have to look through our one of the archival collections related to the Garment Workers Union. Um, are there published studies about this information available at the Centro? And are there books you would recommend to learn more about Puerto Rican women leaders? Uh, yeah, there are, are a ton of books. We have, um, I would say we have like hundreds of books about, about the role of Puerto Rican women in our community. Uh, you know, we have uh, the the, what great title, Puerto Rican Women by Carmen Delgado Botal. Um, we have, uh, have you seen La Nueva Mujer Puerto Riqueña, The Poetry and Lives of Revolutionary Puerto Rican Women, um, which was produced by the New Movement in Solidarity with Puerto Rican and Mexican Revolutions Women's Committee. This was published in 1982. Um, Esperanza Martel, who is another woman that whose collection we have in our collection, uh, wrote a book entitled Moliendo Café, Puerto Rican Women Against All Odds. Um, uh, we have a, a book called Healing Memories, Puerto Rican Women's Literature in the United States. Um, Puerto Rican Women and Work, uh, Bridges and Transnational Labor by Altagracia Ortiz. 
um, New Perspectives in Puerto Rican Women's History by Linda C. Delgado and Felix Matos Rodriguez. Um, in an inter interdisciplinary guide for research and curriculum on Puerto Rican women. Uh, this was edited by Edna Costa Belén, um, among others. Um, there's a, another book, uh, Through the Eyes of Rebel Women, that um, talks about the women's role uh, in the Young Lords Party. Um, there's, there's just a, a, an immense body of, of work on, on the subject and, and something that should be celebrated. Um, and it's also something that we're going to be publishing a, a bibliography on, on for Women's uh, History Month. We're going to be publishing a bibliography of titles that we hope to share with the community. So um, in one of the upcoming newsletters, um, we're going to share a book list um, as well. Um, are there are there books you recommend to? So I uh, you know I mentioned a bunch of books about Puerto Rican. If you if you want a specific uh, bibliography about Puerto Rican women, um, please feel free to email us. Uh, if there's one specifically that you'd like about education or about labor, um, what else do we have? Um, will there be future women focused programs? Um, People mentioning Antonia Pantoja, Evelina Antonetti, uh, Yolanda Sanchez. Absolutely, like this is this is this is like a our surface level um, introduction to the collections and some of the women that we have in our collections. But it is by no means meant to be comprehensive. Um, and and yeah, absolutely, we can do entire uh, series on people like Antonia Pantoja, Pura del Pre, uh, Yolanda Sanchez, of course. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's going to be the 100th birthday of Evelina Lopez Antonetti in September. So there's definitely programming that we're going to be doing in relation to that. Um, and Elba Cabrera and Lillian Lopez, whose collections are also here at Centro. Um, so we're definitely going to give a shine to all these, these w uh, wonderful Puerto Rican women that mean so much to us here in the library and archives and really mean a lot to the community. Um, it's our job to, to facilitate this information, but it's everyone you know, everyone's job as a community to make sure that our children and our young adults uh, understand the prominent uh, role that Puerto Rican women had in the development of uh, labor, education, you know, child raising, um, and, you know, the, 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 uh, the role that they took in civic life and the leadership roles that they played in, in important protest movements. Um, are we going to be posting recordings of this webinar? Yes, actually, on our YouTube page, um, if uh, if Camacho or Saba can put the YouTube the link to the YouTube page there, all the recent um, library lunch hours are are on our YouTube, so you can watch them at your leisure. You can watch them during lunch or during dinner. Um, Where can I subscribe to your newsletter? Um, Saba, would you be able to drop a link below where people can subscribe to our newsletter? Um, yeah, we, we have a weekly newsletter where we have uh, all the programming that is available. Um, we do bi-weekly, we do a library lunch hour, but there's an immense amount of programming that Centro is putting out uh, with a lot of partners. Um, nationalist hero heroines, yep. The Olga Jimenez, the Wagenheim book, another excellent title. That with us, um, which has a lot, that book has a lot uh, on Ruth Reynolds and, and her story and um, and her interactions with the with Pedro Albizu Campos and other independence leaders. Is there a link for the one-on-one -on -one Zoom orientation for the digital archives. So that link would just be the normal form um, that you would fill out to make an appointment. Just uh, it, where where uh, you ask when you would like to do the appointment. Just say that you would like um, a, a a Zoom appointment for orientation, and then we'll work with you uh, to set up a time um, to do an orientation. And we can do this with one-on-one, -on -one, um, but we also um, can do this with classrooms if you'd like, um, whether they're high school, grade school, college, master's programs, 
um, we we are very happy to provide uh, to provide information and orientation about the different resources available at Centro, whether they're bibliographic in nature or whether they're archival in nature. All right. How about Puerto Rican women in the arts, musicians, visual artists, etc.? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a good representation of Puerto Rican women in the arts as well. Um, I, I mentioned uh, Genoveva de Arteaga uh, as just as one, but there, that is just one. We also have Anita Vélez Mitchell, Emily Vélez de Bando, Miriam Colon. Um, you know, there are, there are quite, a, quite a number. Um, and also, um, we're going to be wrapping up the Q&A. Uh, right now, but if you would like to attend future library lunch hours, there's an RSVP link um, next week. Uh, at the next one, uh, we will be talking with um, the Puerto Rican Community Archives uh, from the Newark Public Library. Um, you know, we're again, you know, Centro. We 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 try to be collaborative with as many people as we can, and uh, we are not the only game in town that is archiving Puerto Rican stories and Puerto Rican collections. So we're going to be talking to our neighbors across the river to see what they're doing to document the Puerto Rican community in New Jersey, specifically in Newark, New Jersey. Um, and uh, just as on a, uh, on a personal note in closing, uh, I want to say thank you everyone for making these uh, library lunch hours an overwhelming success. Um, when we started, we, we didn't know you know, if people would be willing to take a time out during the middle of their day, during the middle of their lunch hours, uh, to sit and learn about the different resources that are available in the library and archives. Um, but, you know, these are very well attended. We're really happy with the with the feedback that we're getting. Um, we have a form as well that you can fill out if you would like it to suggest a topic for a future library lunch hour. Um, we look at all these forms that you suggest and if we see trends and we see that people are really clamoring for a specific topic, we make sure to do programming around that. Um, so uh, thank you all um, very much. And uh, again, if there's any emails or any questions that you have, please feel free to email us. Feel free to make an appointment to view our collections either digitally or in person. Uh, and we look forward to having you at a future library lunch hour. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of the day.